Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be here at the Lisbon Council. I know that you have a reputation for exciting and, above all, solution-oriented thinking. And this appeals to me because I'm a very practical person, as Anne said. I'm a doer. I'm someone who wants to bring about real change on the ground and to make a real difference to people's lives. I'm also happy to be here with Anthony Williams, whose book has changed the way we all think about innovation and innovation policy. It's just two days since the Commission adopted its proposal for Europe 2020. Research and innovation are at its core. They are the only way to deliver new sources of growth and sustainable jobs to replace those which have been lost. So naturally, they feature in every part of the document. This means that, that as Research and Innovation Commissioner, I will be responsible for delivering large parts of the strategy. My job is to create the conditions for a more dynamic Europe, where innovative firms want to do business and where talented people want to live and work. My job, in short, is to work with the Member States, with business and other stakeholders, to transform Europe into a really vibrant innovation economy, or what I call an economy. In doing so, I will have the strong support of President Barroso. His personal commitment to the research and innovation agenda is very strong. One of my first tasks will be to draw up a new research and innovation plan, setting out how we intend to drive forward the research and innovation parts of the Europe 2020 agenda. Since innovation is a cross-cutting policy, I will work very closely with other Commissioner colleagues on this, such as Industry Commissioner Antonio Tajani and the Commissioner for the Digital Agenda, Nelly Cruz. The European Parliament, and in particular the Industry Research and Energy Committee, will be involved at every stage along the way. This plan will have to be ready by September because the heads of state and government have decided to hold a special discussion on research and innovation at the Autumn European uh, Council. And this, I think, is yet another sign of their growing importance for our economy and society. <coughs> the plan will make clear my intention to refocus research and innovation policies very clearly on the so-called grand challenges facing our society. Climate change, energy security, food security, health and an ageing population. And it will be based on a broad understanding of innovation. The economy depends on a strong science base, but we must also be able to transform our inventions into innovative products and services that the customer wants. As I said during my parliamentary hearing, we need to connect up and speed up innovation along the whole policy chain from research to retail. Equally, more attention should be paid to other forms of innovation, such as business model or management innovation, design and marketing, and services innovation, all of which have largely unrelated uh, research spending. We must remember, as Mr. Williams' excellent e-brief points out, that scientists are not the only innovators. Indeed, innovation is not limited to the private sector. It can and must happen in schools, in hospitals, creches, community centres and care homes. In an age of fiscal austerity, we must get more for less from our public sector. Mr Williams's e-brief contains some very valuable insights. We are indeed living in the white hot heat of the internet revolution. The pace of change is indeed faster than with previous technology driven revolutions. We are seeing the emergence of a new type of business which co-innovates with its customers and even its competitors, and which rather than relying solely on its own employees, puts some of its data into the public realm to leverage the talents and the insights of the global research community. This has huge implications for the economy, for education, for energy, and indeed for government itself. It's fascinating on an intellectual level, but of course, as a decision maker, I want to know in very concrete terms what I can do to help Europe succeed in this brave new world. One issue that I know aroused this morning and indeed continues to arouse a lot of interest is the 3% R&D target. I know it's controversial, 
but I believe that it should stay. Research ministers have told me in very clear terms, indeed as uh, late as earlier this week, that its existence has strengthened their hand in their dealings with their finance ministers. Indeed, in most member states, R&D intensity has increased since its introduction. Our failure to meet it is due to the disappointing performance in some of the bigger countries. Now is exactly the wrong moment to remove this discipline. With budgets under pressure, governments may view research and development as an easy area for cutbacks. But we know from the experiences of countries like Finland that raising R&D budgets is the route to recovery. The Commission is therefore proposing to retain the 3% target. While developing an indicator to capture research and innovation performance, I've decided to set up a panel of experts to advise me on this. And that panel will be made up of economists and innovation experts. Equally, while the Commission is proposing to retain the 3% target, it will not be business as usual. It will be applied in a much smarter way. It's often believed that a one-size-fits-all 3% target, that this is indeed what it is. But in fact, as we know, member states set their own national targets according to their particular circumstances. From now on, we will be asking them to do so as part of a coherent and indeed realistic vision. Targets will not be plucked out of thin air with no clear idea of how to meet them. Rather, they will be the product of a careful reflection on the particular member state's economic future and indeed the role that R&D can play in that future. We are suggesting national targets with robust monitoring. Moreover, we will get serious about improving the conditions for R&D investment, particularly in the private sector. This is where Europe's R&D spending gap is. It accounts for two-thirds of the target. I see the priorities as follows. First, as the e-brief says, the secret to success now lies in collaboration across borders and cultures. That is why we must have a single unified research area in Europe within which researchers and knowledge can move around freely. It is known as the European Research Area and I'm determined to make it a success. For example, I want to remove once and for all the pension and social security obstacles which prevent researchers from moving freely between countries.